in warfare. We're more able to take them out of units and then put them back in because you wouldn't be taking a different person out, you'd be putting literally the same genetic person back into that army. That makes units more flexible. It means you're more able to sub people out and rest people. No, thank you. And because our soldiers would have better reflexes, because they wouldn't need to sleep as much, they'd be able to do a better job within warfare. We think all of those things means that the US, no thank you, does a better job at protecting Japan from China. It means it can do a better job at protecting Japan from Taiwan, and it should be able to do that in order to ensure, no thank you, that the world power dynamic remains the same. Finally, on this issue of the US fulfilling its obligations under humanitarian systems. We say that it does two things when it produces a genetic clone army. Not only does it increase the number of troops and improve their capacity to do things, it also improves the willingness to go into war. On the first of these, we said that the reason, or one of the reasons why the US is very unwilling to go into Syria is because it would need to donate a further 100,000 troops that it just doesn't have. We're not saying that the US definitely should go into Syria, but what we're saying is the stumbling block definitely shouldn't be that it doesn't have enough troops. That shouldn't be a consideration. They should be able to go into Syria if that's the right idea, but at the moment they simply don't have the capacity to do. We give you a world where they have that capacity. We give you a world where we could stop that civil war if we deemed that military intervention was the best option. That's not something you could ever give us. But we also think we change the nature of warfare in a significant way. For instance, one clone army, one clone who didn't need to sleep would be able to do a much better job than a drone if he could just sit there under some camouflage for 90 hours at a time without needing to sleep, go out and kill the one terrorist who the drone was meant to kill. That way you don't kill a lot of Pakistani civilians along with the drone strike. That means you have more Pakistani civilians on site. So it also makes it a whole lot more moral. Sure. What well, makes you believe that no other country will be able to develop clients once the yeah, US has? Yeah. yeah, but like, the point is, to be clear, if the US has the capacity to develop drones, to develop clones, <laughs> and China has the capacity to develop clones, China definitely will have already, which means the US desperately needs to be able to match that. And that means it should definitely be able to keep up with that. But even if that's not the case, we still say that we get the improvement in humanitarian obligation, because if China also produces a huge army of clones, we get mutually assured destruction because neither army will ever deploy them. But it does mean the US is able to deploy parts of that army in order to fill its humanitarian obligations that I'm talking about now, and that's particularly good. So we also say that we improve the capacity to get more humanitarian obligation because people will be more willing to send in troops when it's not their own American sons and daughters, when it's just a generic clone who they're able to send into warfare because they don't feel emotional attachment to that drone. It means they're more willing that yeah, clone. Yeah, God, why can't I say that? They're more willing <laughs> to send people in. We say that's better because it means there's not, again, a stumbling block that just shouldn't be there. We give you a bigger army, we give you a better army, we give you an army that can better deal with China, we give you an army that's more able to go in in the cases of humanitarian intervention, negative things you, none of that. And that's why the US needs its own genetically modified clone army. <laughs> Why is it into 
preemptive or large warfare. Moreover, you incentivize China into creating its own clone army. Why is that particularly bad? Because when you have two armies of like indispensable clones, that is when you create the worst long-term outcome for society. Much more on that later on. Fourthly, who the fuck says that the US is actually going to be a world power in 2050? The barely world power now. No. So, they tell us that it's immoral, like we tell you that this is fundamentally immoral on the individual person. You are breeding a slave army, guys. No, thank you. You are giving them human characteristics and essentially a human identity, yet you are telling them that they are less than other people. You're breeding them, telling them that the only function they have in society is to go to war on your behalf. We think that's disgusting. You wouldn't do that with slaves, Mr. Speaker. Why are we doing it with clones that we created? We, uh, thirdly, they tell us that, like, that war will be more moral on their side of the house. Rubbish. Firstly, if it is true that you fight more better, we say that incentivizes you to go to war more, that creates less moral outcomes. Secondly, I'm going to tell you why it is that it's far more likely to send these in recklessly right now. Firstly, morality of warfare, why we fight less moral wars. A couple of reasons. Firstly, proportionality. We say that proportionality really matters in warfare, Mr. Speaker. That is why we have abolitions on biological warfare and why we hate nuclear weapons. Because they are inherently indiscriminate, they are inherently more likely to create loss of life, a loss, lo a loss of life. Why is it that we are less proportional with clones? Firstly, they are more dispensable. What reason do you have not to go to war, Mr. Speaker, when the entire army that you are sending into that war is a bunch of people you do not give a fuck about? When we, what we tell you is that when you have an army that you are happy to send into a war, you are far more likely to go to war as a first resort. What reason do you have to go to mediation or conciliation or to like you know, sit down at a negotiating table with other countries when you are happy to sacrifice the lives of people that you do not care about? And if you do care about them, guys, why are you not giving them the rights of other human beings? You need to reconcile that. No. Secondly, you're far more less likely to use discretion when you're in war, right? You're far more likely to send in a vast offensive of clone weapons because they're easily <coughs> reproducible, right? You do not care about the fact that you're using them because you have an unlimited army on your side of the house. That leads to less discretionary warfare. When you have, you, it is the sacrifice and the human element of warfare, Mr. Speaker, that leads you to be discretionary in who you send into battle. We say you create larger warfare and escalating warfare when you lose that fear of casualties. Thirdly, though, we tell you that the management is screwed. What accountability do you have when you have clones on the ground, Mr. Speaker, who you are happy to put the blame on every time something immoral happens, every time something that does not go your way happens, right? We say that what you create is a system where the people who are making decisions are no longer accountable to the people for those decisions. That leads to less moral warfare because the public's no longer accountable for what occurs when these clones go to war. Because you're happy to say, oh, I'm sorry, these guys, you know, had a malfunction. Or we did not recognise that the clones were doing that. That's something that's in their systems, right? The fourth thing that we tell you, though, is that the individual morality of the actor is very, very important in warfare. I'll take you in a second. We say it's often on the ground that sanctity of human life that stops you killing when you can capture, that, stop, like, that leads you to have a relationship with that other army, Mr. Speaker. When you take that away, you make people kill when they can capture. When they do not respect that life, they are far more likely to do things that are incredibly inhumane and immoral, Nicholas. So, to be clear, it's wrong to clone people for the sake of sending them to war, yet your response to not having enough soldiers is breed more. No! My response is go to war more and be discretionary in war. What I said is that as a counter we would prefer to have human beings involved in war for all of the reasons I just gave you. Sir. The governments give more of a shit about the people in the war, Nicholas. The people on the ground are able to act humanely, which means that they are less likely to make immoral decisions on the ground in warfare. Please listen. So, secondly, why does this make the USA more militaristic? Firstly, we say that sacrifice is essential to that warfare in terms of the respect for the lives of the opposition, Mr. Speaker. It is saying it is the fear of your own casualties that leads you to understand the fear that the opposition have for their casualties. Until you have that respect for your opposition army, you are far less likely to take that opposition into account in your decision-making calculus. We say it's very important for a moral warfare. What you do, Mr. Speaker, is you turn the USA into a military machine, right? When you have an identity that is formed on the fact that you have people bred specifically for military warfare, you are far more likely to go out and search for that military outcome. We say that is incredibly bad, Mr. Speaker. But secondly, we say that it's incredibly bad for like the world, right? Because what we say is that what you force the rest of the countries to do is to like try to catch up, right? You force other countries to try to develop their own clone armies. Why is that bad? Firstly, at the point in which these countries do not have their own clone armies, what you are doing is you're forcing humans to 
flat drones. We say that is when you get the least moral outcome in warfare because you have, by your own account, the greatest advantage. That makes you far more likely to go into wars that do not need to be got into. Secondly, though, we say it expands the battlefield. When you're happy to send clones into any sort of place where they look like humans, they dress like humans, there is no longer a battlefield that is safe, Mr. Speaker. They will go into civilian places in order to commit military outcomes. We say that's extraordinarily harmful. But the most harmful outcome we can possibly have in this debate is an outcome in which both countries have clones. Why? When both countries have indispensable armies, how is it that you're going to avoid war? If China hates the USA as much as you say they do, and the USA hates, like, hates China as much as they do. When you do have no incentive to stop that war, Mr. Speaker, that war is far more likely to continue on into perpetuity. The last thing that we would say is that should you win this war, you absolutely screw the ability of yourself to be able to work within these countries into the future. Because the fact that you do not care about your humanity means that you're far more likely to do things that take away the fabric of that society. You're far more likely to do things like bomb churches, right? Things that we recognise as humane with each other. When you take that away, Mr. Speaker, the moral fabric of the society that you're in breaks down. That is far harder for you to then rebuild that society into the future and allow them to have their humanity back. Because you don't respect the humanity of their human life, that's what clones do. Mr. Speaker, this model stupid must fall. Thank you, first lady. For respect, we now about the second term to do these guys. Be more disloyal than yours, except that they seem to think 
coins lack a fundamental humanity, which is just an assertion, and like, where the action, we decide what coins are, this is just cool. <laughs> no thing. Secondly, on the impact on warfare and state relations, they say, China, why would we need to fight China? I think Taiwan would probably give you a few reasons answers to that question. I think people who dispute the islands in the South China Sea might give you a few answers to that question. I think Tibet might give you a few answers to that question. The reality is, if China stormed into Taiwan tomorrow, the US couldn't stop them. We couldn't do shit about it, because they have a million people in their army, and the US people are deployed in a bunch of different countries. We literally have no capacity to stop China from doing whatever they want. We don't necessarily think China will. We think the fact that they're growing their army indicates that they might, and that if we do nothing to stop them, then they could. And we think that the detente created by us both having massive clone armies is an important one there. No, thank you. Then they say, well, they won't fear sacrifice um, because like, we just send people into wars all the time. We say at the moment there is an aversion to war because people don't want their sons and daughters coming home in body bags. We think that fundamentally changes when it's not people's sons and daughters, it's a clone army. We think that the balance of that versus not wanting to lose military and clone resources will actually result in a better balance of when we go into conflict than now. And the conflicts we're losing out on at the moment are humanitarian ones where people are dying as a consequence of their government systematically taking them down. Okay. Finally, what I'd like to say on this is I actually think it probably improves with respect to the asymmetric warfare they were talking about, like nukes and chemical weapons. We say anything you can put between us and the use of a nuclear weapon or the use of a chemical weapon is a good thing. We think more troops is something that distances us from making threats with nuclear weapons. We think that we'd rather threaten fighting with a clone army than threaten using a nuke. We think that that's a better type of mutually assured destruction. Two points. Firstly, military efficacy, which is going to deal with some of Josh's business. I will get to in a second, friend. And secondly, improving military behavior and conditions within the military. Yes. Which is it? Are clones humane and have humanity, in which case you are doing some disgusting things to them by not allowing them to vote or be citizens and grooming them for warfare? Well, or are they not humane, in which case they are incapable of making humane decisions on the ground when it comes to capturing rather than killing? Whoa, bro. When did I say I wasn't letting them vote or be citizens? What? I didn't. I, what? what? When did I say that? Was that a model? I don't recall that. You can't make up a model for me and then tell it to me. Fuck you. Okay. <laughs> Like less likely to than normal people to enter the army, and you don't have a change. But secondly, 
what they actually told us at first half is like we're genetically engineering these people to like be better soldiers, to be bred for war, to like follow orders and those sorts of things, like impairing their cognitive capacity as human beings. We think that that's probably more closer to their, their actual position, Mr. Speaker, because that's what's going to lead to more people being in that army and being effective in terms of the military efficacy. Um, KP wanted to talk about. But what we say fundamentally is like that opens up a whole new can of worms in terms of like you're engineering people with impaired cognitive capacity who cannot make decisions for themselves. And if you say at second half that you fundamentally acknowledge their full human rights, and then you say at first half that you're taking away their ability to engage in a life as a human being, Mr. Speaker, that is entirely inconsistent. What we say is like what you have told us is that these soldiers are going to be bred for war. What you have told us is that they're going to be engineered to follow orders. What you have told us is like you're creating a caste of people, and even though you said they can opt out, which is very convenient in your model where you can genetically enhance everything about these clones except their aging rate. <laughs> but like, you think that's fundamentally inconsistent? Yes! Yes! If you can genetically engineer them to like follow orders, you can probably genetically engineer them to know battle tactics, Mr. Speaker. This is the future. So, <laughs> what we say is like when you're engineering these people to follow orders, it fundamentally takes away their capacity to engage in like the full freedoms and things associated with human rights. And we think that's fundamentally a human rights violation. <laughs> Two issues in rebuttal are clones equal to drones? And secondly, this issue of military efficacy. What we say is, first of all, even if clones are equal to drones, we oppose drones. Yeah, what we yeah. say is, secondly, that drones are not, we say that drones are not alive. We say there's a fundamental distinction between using like electronic tools and like living organisms for those purposes. Particularly when those living organisms resemble human beings, or like what KP said, are actually human beings. Um, you see that it fundamentally changes the moral obligations that society has. We say that when you're using human life in an expendable way, that changes the way that society approaches war. And we say that like, it changes the way that how life is seen. It means that life, human life, can be, or similar things to human life, can be used as a tool, and that changes yeah. the way that terms of like death can be used as a tool in society, Mr. Speaker. More about some standard. But our third response to this issue is that, like, finally, it seems it's fundamentally a human rights violation to alter people's cognitive capacity before they enter their life, Mr. Speaker. Before they can have that education and can free free to make their choices. The fact that you're breeding them to follow orders means that they'll never have that capacity, Mr. Speaker. They'll never have those rights. Yeah, yeah. In terms of the military efficacy, what we say, first of all, once again, this is the future. We have laser beams. We think that it's just probably going to be alternatives to coins. But we say secondly, like, even if we don't develop those, we have nukes. We think that ultimately if we do have a massive derby between the USA and China, it's probably going to be resolved through a nuclear war, Mr. Speaker. We don't see this, this, this scenario of like this ground warfare and conventional warfare happening when you have those two superpowers. We have the Cold War to prove that, when you never had that ground warfare between the Soviet Union and America, because you have this concept of mutually assured destruction. So we think that like all their analysis about like we need a bigger conventional army does not stand up to their analysis about why we need to have a power dynamic with China, when you have ultimately an end game strategy where both parties are equal. Yeah, equal yeah. being you wipe out the other party. So what we say is like, secondly, um, our final response to this is like, we do also limit weapons even despite their efficacy. And we see this all the time when there is an overall humanitarian link. We see this in like developing POW camps. Like it's far more efficient to just kill all the enemies of enemy combatants that you've captured, Mr. Speaker. But we realize that when you have that humanitarian aim of keeping those people alive and that have that moral duty, that you take away some of that military efficacy and those military resources in order to meet those moral obligations. We're happy to stand for that. In terms of substantive, what are our moral obligations generally in society and why is it morally inhumane to use to breed clients to go to war? First of all, we say that like what this does is it devalues the way human life is set. We say there's an inherent value to human life we said it as um, self-evident truth. What we'll say is there's no distinction that they've been able to point to um, between why these humans do not deserve those particular things. Why we say this is problematic is because it positions human life to be seen as a tool rather than as something that is respected by other human beings. What we say fundamentally is like um, there's no moral outrage associated with the clone dying because they don't have that same family, they don't have these connections to society, Mr. Speaker. What we say is first of all, it makes the clone subservient. It means that like I can use human life to be a convenience to me. And once you start down that path, it changes your decision-making calculus and how you view human life, Mr. Speaker. We say it makes people lazy, it makes people willing to disrespect human life. And we say it makes people willing to use, more likely to use death as a tool in everyday society, Mr. Speaker, when they don't recognise that inherent value of human life. Second point of analysis, what we say is like the harms to the clones themselves. And we say that these, these are people who are 
sentience and to the extent that they become self-aware that they do belong to a caste and everyone around them is essentially being used as a slave for the military purposes of the United States. We say that that's going to be fundamentally harmful for them because the natural state of human life is to be free, is to ask questions. And we say that they get used in that particular fact, that's going to be fundamentally harmful. What we say a third level of analysis is that the fact the act of claiming does require the destruction of embryos and the destruction of human life. There are deep moral questions which have not been answered by the economy in this debate. The moral obligations of breeding clones for wars. Second substantive, because I like signposting. What we say is, first of all, three levels of analysis. We say that clones fundamentally are going to be very, very difficult to have their human rights in their house, Mr. Speaker. Why is that? Because they've been bred for war. Because other parties don't see them as human beings, and so they won't be able to show them the same respect. Yeah. What we say is, like, when you've been bred for war, when you're, like, genetically engineered to follow orders, despite what those orders can and can't do, the entire system of international humanitarian law, which is set up to protect the rights of peoples in those wars, fails. Why? First of all, we have this principle of distinction. There is a normal duty to distinguish between military actions and non-military members, and to only target the military actors. Why is that different? Because under their model, these people do not have that choice to change their status from being a military actor to being a non-military actor. They don't have that capacity to surrender like a normal soldier does, Mr. Speaker. What we say secondly is like they can't make the same on-field decisions that normal soldiers can, Mr. Speaker, because they've been bred to follow those orders. Josh told you that. They can't make those decisions to retreat, to preserve their own life, Mr. Speaker. 